making money through e-commerce in China. Now this is thoughtful. Hello, I'm Trevor Lai in Shanghai. Marketers are eager to expand their operations beyond established markets like Shanghai and Beijing, but it's difficult to establish a network of brick and mortar stores in China's lower tier cities. Here's the good news. They may not have to. China has a thriving e-commerce industry. Nearly 60% of PC internet users are online shoppers. China's retail market is relatively young overall, but its e-commerce revenue will overtake the US as early as 2015 representing enormous opportunities for marketers to build brands without having to invest in expensive flagship stores across hundreds of cities. This week on Thoughtful China, we'll look at the reasons e-commerce has grown so quickly in China and examine the best KPIs to know if your e-commerce strategy is working. And our own Tim Schlick will share three tips to make sure your brand appeals to Chinese bargain hunters. But first, with us is Phoenix Chen, e-commerce manager for L'Oreal's luxury division. Locally, giants such as Sina and Baidu tend to dominate the online industry. E-commerce is no different. Obviously, Taobao controls about 80% of e-commerce sales, including Taobao.com and Tmall. For luxury brands, what are some of the advantages and risks of working with a platform like Tmall? I think as a luxury brand, uh, we will consider whether the e-retailers, uh, the e-retailers here uh, means uh, the platform like Tmall, uh, whether it can present the luxury uh, experience for the customer and whether uh, our target consumers are in this, uh, whether they can shop in Tmall. So this is the two points we will consider whether we go to the uh, Tmall. And now you manage a portfolio of brands really within the luxury division. Yes. So how important it is it for the division overall in terms of having an e-commerce presence? And for example, in terms of actual real revenue generating sales, or is it more about building the brand's presence online? I think it really depends on, um, in personal speaking, I think different companies have different uh, strategy uh, positioning for e-commerce because uh, some brands may think it's a uh, revenue uh, coming from e-commerce, something uh, some companies mean uh, will think that it might be the growth coming from e-commerce, and some brands will treat it as the gaining customer channel. So, uh, in personal speaking, I think e-commerce should be uh, one sales channel for brands. Plus, uh, as the more and more younger generation uh, spending their time on internet, it's also the uh, channel which help the, custom, uh, help the brand to gaining younger generation. So looking at the market today, do you think consumers in China are ready to be purchasing luxury goods purely online? I guess so, because we find that not uh, every luxury brand has the department store in every city. So for the people who travel in Shanghai, maybe they live in the second tier cities, uh, they will feel comfortable to buy online if there is not the luxury department store in their city. So it's uh, good for the people to do the replenishment in e-commerce site. It's much more convenient. So customers are already familiar with yeah. the brand and the products yes. and just replenishing. Yes, and also it's an authentic uh, channel to buy online on the brand official site because the, uh, the customer do not uh, need to fear about whether they buy the fake products in uh, in other e-retailer platform because it's in the brand site or the brand authentic uh, e-retailer site. So that's an important point because you're talking about having and controlling your own channel online. Yeah. Um, but in terms of that, the actual interaction with the consumer is still quite limited because mm -hmm. really you have fairly static web pages with the products. Have you seen any innovation in terms of luxury brands introducing, for example, 24-hour customer service online to give the customer a little bit more of that feeling that they're in a personal interaction sales experience like they would be if they went to a counter? Um, I think uh, in the site, you can gain uh, check our sites, for example. Uh, you can have the you you can be the first one to get the products because we always do the pre-launch in the official site, and you can uh, gain the exclusive offers in the e-commerce site. And the third point is you can get uh, get, you can make sure that you can buy uh, authentic products in our site with 24 hours no stop shopping experience. 
So how does your e-commerce experience replicate the in-store experience of having a beauty advisor actually at the counter talking to your customers? Actually, in our sites, we already ha have the online BA. In uh, using this way, people can experience the same experience in the department store. Because when do you, uh, if you have the uh, skincare problems, you can just click on the online chat with our CSR, and then they can answer the uh, any questions that concerning how to do the skin uh, care issues. Yeah. So what are some of the key KPIs that you use in terms of evaluating your e-commerce strategy and whether it's be effective? I think uh, it depend, really depends on the brands. Uh, sales, I think most of the brands will say that maybe sales is the main KPIs to uh, judge whether you are doing e-commerce well. But to a more long-term uh, prospects, I think uh, whether you are gaining uh, whether e-commerce is helping the brand to gain more customers, uh, gaining more online customers, or whether uh, e-commerce is helping the total brand to uh, growing faster the business in China. It's also the two index for uh, managing whether e-commerce is doing well in China. Thanks, Phoenix. Now we'll hear from Tim with a thought or two about what China's online shoppers really want. Chinese are big online shoppers, but they don't click and buy like their counterparts in the West. So here are three things to keep in mind to win their wallets. First, presentation. Westerners may get an epileptic seizure looking at a Chinese website with all that bling and blitz. Websites in China contain about 30% more information than European or US sites. The trick is in a sophisticated filtering. Chinese don't view this as information overload though. They demand information at their fingertips and convenient filters. Taobao's layout is so efficient it takes you only a couple of clicks to find the product you're looking for. Second, motivation. Westerners mostly shop online for convenience, but in China, the kick for the click is much more driven around availability and value. Availability means access to brands and goods otherwise not available beyond tier two cities. Try buying the latest Sony camera or limited edition Louis Vuitton bag somewhere like Datong without going online. Value is even more important. Most Chinese pride themselves on their bargain hunting skills. When it comes to finding and getting the best deals, the internet is the ultimate tool to compare prices and get opinions. Third, obstruction. China is plagued by fake products and ingredients. Trust is commonly ranked as the top obstacle to making an online purchase. Taobao's parent Alibaba took an important step to this downside with Alipay to ensure consumers pay only for products that they wanted to pay for. But consumer protection remains the key challenge to growing e-commerce in China. So here are the th key things to remember. Present comprehensive information and understand what will motivate consumers to buy your products online. Provide outstanding value, availability, and deliver it. And make sure shoppers can trust you. Thanks, Tim. With me now is one of our regular guests, Clement Tsang, Head of Performance China, as well as Dale Preston, Senior Vice President of Nielsen Greater China, and George Godula, Managing Director of web to asia As Tim just pointed out, consumers browse, click, and shop differently in China than in Western markets. Let's look at some of those differences today. What are some of the differences between China and the US and Europe in terms of the way that consumers shop and also in terms of what they shop for? Let's start with consumers, Dale. So we see it's a couple of differences uh, in terms of consumers in uh, China versus the rest of the world. If we think about income, um, we see they, they're slightly higher income versus the rest of the world, so that's a, an important difference. In terms of the way they shop, um, we, we, we see differences, and also the why they shop. In terms of the way they shop or, or what they buy online, um, we see, if you look at other markets, electronics is very, very popular uh, online, generally number one category. If you look at China, it tends to be things like uh, apparel. Um, China does have some differences, some unique differences if you think about uh, things like personal care and baby products. Uh, in other markets around the world that could be 3 or 4% of the category. In China that can be 20% of the category. And in fact for some manufacturers it can be 40% of their sales, so quite big. And then in terms of why they shop online, look at other markets around the world and it's often for convenience. It's just an, it you know, saves time, it's a very convenient factor. In China it's all about price. Consumers are going online to find the best possible price. That's interesting. Your first point was that the consumers in China have relatively higher income, those who are shopping online. Yeah. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? Because yeah, so compared I, to the US. Yeah, so compared to, so let's take, for example, a, a, an Asian um, sort of comparison. So if you look at China versus Korea and Japan, uh, in China, it's about 20% of the population would be what we would call high income. 
uh, versus Japan and Korea where it's probably closer to 10% of the population. Uh, and so it's just a slightly higher group uh, that we would call high income. Now, George, you spent a lot of time studying the actual journey of the consumer, as Dale's just mentioned, some of the motivations and uh, decision-making processes. Can you take us through the journey in more detail? Right, sure. So what we've done recently is we looked at, we have data both from uh, e-commerce retailers in uh, Europe, for example, as well as in China. So what we looked at is of the, the consumer journey that uh, you know, a person in China takes from initial contact with the brand down to the purchase. So the interesting uh, thing is if we look at markets like Germany, I myself am from Austria, so we looked at some of the German data. There we got data like the consumer journey takes around 33 days on average from the initial uh, contact of a person with a brand until they make a purchase, purchase online. Uh, it also includes that on average, for example, they will make 11 searches on a search engine, but in total they have over 40 interactions, be it with banners, be it with you know, social media, things like that. So that's data from Europe, benchmark data. When we took that to China and you know, did a similar comparison with what our clients are doing here, things are amplified. You know, it can be two to three times as much, simply because of uh, the one thing we mentioned previously was of the price sensitivity, that the consumer is much more engaged in the actual price comparison uh, process, which uh, requires him to take many more action searches and on also many more touch points, be it in social media, BBSs or Weibo, to reassure him that he's really you know, doing the right choice when you find the purchase. Exactly, deal, exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and Clement, in terms of pricing, I know you've also looked into some of the uh, uh, influencing factors and things like that. I think we, if we return back to the consumer journey, we can say half of the consumers are new. So any new interaction is also focused at a traditional retail point, the retail experience, the traditional media platforms. And I think most big advertisers are still focused on delivering that message and rolling out stores. A uh, recent Bain report said that in 2011, 62% of new sales relates to store openings and demand generated from just the store opening. On a reflective side, those consumers who do know about the brand, who know about the price, they're the ones who are more price savvy, more tech savvy, more likely to be those people in that tech channel. So I think we need to balance both, point, both points of view uh, and moving forward, allow the brand to understand what is the priority, store openings or e-commerce sales. I think for most of them, they're saying we need a good blend Perhaps this year, because of consumer confidence being low, they're more focused on sales. But in previous years, it was all about expansion, awareness, and grabbing market share. Well, it's interesting that all three of you have touched on a similar point and a common thread, which is the consumer, the Chinese consumers, need to find the best bargain and mm -hmm. find the best price. And as we all know here, the e-commerce platform provider that's the leader is Taobao, which literally means the search for treasure. So, I mean, when you look at Taobao as a leader in the marketplace, if you're a brand, are they someone easy to deal with and that actually helps facilitate the e-commerce strategies and depending on which direction you're heading? Is, is Taobao a good partner in that sense? I think Taobao's pedigree is focused on small, medium enterprise. Uh, it is primarily a C2C platform and that's why they built out Tmall, specifically for B2C for advertisers who directly wanted to talk to that market. Uh, in addition to that, because of that change from a C2C to a B2C platform, the service level had to change, and they're still adopting. I think from an ag agency point of view, they are much more difficult to deal with compared to other publishers. Like Glamour Sales for Luxury, or 360 Buy, or Dong Dong, or even Amazon? Correct. And I think the price positioning is, uh, you know, it's, it's potentially not sustainable. If you look at the way it's gone in other markets, the ability, for, if, you, if you go in store now, a lot of electronic stores in Europe or, or the US, you can go in and they, they have signs in the store that basically say, we will match any price you can find on Amazon, for example. So that price position is not sustainable. So the retailers and the platforms really need to change the way they think about mm. their positioning to try and drive loyalty through other things like ser after sales service, like can I get my product delivered when I expect it to be delivered? Can I be confident that it's the genuine product that comes to my door. They're really, really important factors beyond now price. We have to move away from price. And let's look at return on investment for e-commerce in China. I mean, is there a reliable way to measure whether or not your e-commerce strategy is working in China? Hmm. I think it's more um, e-commerce is an objective. It's, it's an, a mentality that the client has to use. Uh, it's also about tracking. And from there, that's, therein lies the largest problem for Taobao and Tmall is that the tracking that they allow is not transparent. Moving from that though, it then moves into the whole digital spectrum and the whole marketing spectrum. It's e-commerce as a mentality. Uh, it shouldn't just be considered a tactical sales point. I think ultimately that's what the advertiser and the platforms all need to address together. 
And as we t hear more and more about luxury brands wanting to increase their uh, e-commerce presence online, I mean, would there ever be clients where you would just literally say, do not certainly. You know, establish? Certainly, certainly. In terms of uh, not establish possibly the actual sales and checkout process, but to utilize you know, e-commerce as a part of, the, of an integrated digital strategy. And that's also important to realize that e-commerce, like, like Clement mentioned, should not only be seen from a sales perspective, but also from a, a brand perspective. So the moment uh, as a luxury brand would go online, uh, preferably on, on a standalone store, for example, where, you have the, where they have full control over the experience, it will not only you know, influence their online sales, but it will in, in, in total leverage their brand perception and brand familiarity among consumers. So if we look at it in that way, uh, I think there's a you know, much wider set of KPIs that can be applied to come back to your question to you know, calculate an ROI, not only in terms of monetary or immediate ROI, but also to calculate in terms of how does e-commerce influence my other channels online and my offline sales. And by that, uh, you know, metrics like, like engagement uh, or even down to uh, customer lifetime value can be applied. So I think that's the most important lesson from what we're seeing is, especially in China, to not only consider e-commerce as a pure sales ROI channel, but to integrate it with all the other different uh, channels, both offline and online. And I think if you take that point and think about it from the real world perspective, the challenge that brand owners have is just that internal battle between the budgets. And so if you just think about it from a sales return on investment, you're not likely to invest the right amount of money that should go towards it. If you really think about it holistically, you, you, you then start to think about it very, very differently in terms of the funding that it should get. Um, and finding additional funding to support it as opposed to just taking it a little bit from here and here uh, is also very important to have a very successful uh, e-commerce strategy. What's one thing you wish advertisers understood better about e-commerce in China? I think for advertisers, the one key thing really to, to, to think about is that uh, e-commerce e and your digital sort of strategy has to be very different to what you do. You can't just pick up what you do for other channels and apply it to, to e-commerce. It doesn't work that way. It's a different format. You need to do things slightly differently. And we see a lot of just take what I have in print and put it online. And that doesn't really work. It's a different dynamic. It's whole different. So having a separate team that really focuses on how to drive that strategy is very important. So that we stop seeing print ads used as banners. Correct. And George, what do you wish advertisers understood better about using e-commerce in China? Mm. So I think if I could sum it up in one word, it would be integration. Um, what I believe is important that uh, brand clients understand that e-commerce is just one part of their overall digital strategy, as well as also their overall integrated strategy offline. So By 2015, China's e-commerce will be larger than the United States and the biggest in the world. So you have to be online, that's the first case. Second case is look after your own store. Own media, your storefront, your consumer experience, that is a key critical item. After you dealt with your website, then talk about paid media. Talk about where you're going to advertise, where you should universe your search, search money, where are your sales. Without first taking care of your own brand, there's no point in discussing where you're going to spend your advertising dollars. Clement, Dale, George, thanks for joining us on Thoughtful China. That wraps it up for today. Be sure to subscribe to us on Tudo and YouTube, and you can also follow us on Weibo and Twitter, or join our LinkedIn group. Thanks, we'll see you again.